that, the interesting thing as we get started this morning, I began to post. A little blurb come up saying there was a problem with uh, with the posting. Did I want to continue? And I said, yes, but I, I, I want something out there, but nothing came up. So I thought, uh, I better. So I shut that down, restarted, rebooted, resend out. My message went up. You all came up. So I, maybe I caught a problem before we ever got started. Wouldn't that be nice? That would be a first. That would be a first, wouldn't it? Good morning, good morning, Brenda and Brent. First up, God bless you, love you, love you, love you. I I got to tell you all. I uh, saw what Brent's been doing with the nativity pieces, and I was so blessed by by looking at that. And I'm remembering back when we first put that together years ago, and uh, you know I just. Uh, I just got to give a shout out. Thank you. Just, I think everybody's got to be. We haven't been able to put the nativity set up for a couple of years because, well, it was just pretty much, pretty much seen its its lifespan. But uh, Brent took on the project of of resurrecting it, and uh, just unbelievable, just beautiful. I think everybody's going to be really, 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 really pleased. I I, I really do. Uh, so I just want to give a shout out and say thank you, Brent. I appreciate it very much. Miss Debbie, good morning to you. Daniel, you're at work. Be careful. I'm glad you're listening. It is a blessing. Miss Ruth, it was good to see you yesterday. And give Kenneth a shout out. Hi for us, will you? Teresa, good to have you back yesterday. We missed you. Miss Alyssa, yes. And I had Kim. Carrie, you played hooky. Party on Saturday night. You still got to be there on Sunday morning. That was the rule in our house. If you're going to party on Saturday night, you still got to get up and go on Sunday morning. But uh, I missed you yesterday, but uh, had a great time with Cameron. And it was wonderful to see Mr. Cody. All right. Miss Sherry, good morning, brothers and sisters. We have a living hope. We are free from the burden of those heavy chains. Isn't that right? Angel, good morning to you, blessed girl. Give that sweet little Thena a big hug, will you? Alyssa says the pictures of the nativity were amazing. Absolutely. Love the donkey. At any rate, we're gonna, you're all going to be able to see it, and it's going to go up this year. And we're all kind of excited about that. And it is uh, Monday morning on the uh, 21st day of uh, October. Uh, one more week, uh, well, we, this week and then next, end of October. And then we're into November. Folks, you got to know the holiday season is right around the corner. So uh, be praying. Went to see Carolyn yesterday, and she was in such good spirits. Still a lot of pain uh, whenever she tries to move or something. But but such good spirits sweet wonderful lady uh cards letters phone calls just expressions of love visit drop in drop out but uh you know she uh she misses you all any rate uh savannah good morning to you be savannah hug thank you and there is miss laura chris is on his way home yay he was on flight routes and now he's on his way home neat 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 young man all right we have been looking at and i'll put this up here enemies of the gospel and what uh, uh just to to abbreviate last week he, he, we, we learned one truth out of this is that you can never be able to you you can't and never will be able to please everyone all the time not even yourself so be concentrating on uh, of uh, of pleasing just one person, and that person is Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what other people think. It 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 might hurt when they think or do things that are hurtful toward you, but uh, you have an audience of one, and it is that audience of one that you spend your life trying to please. Uh, now, yes, we are told to. Uh, to work to please men, but only in the respect as it helps them to grow in their relationship with God, uh, grow up in in Christian character, uh, to build them up in that way. So yeah, but if if pleasing them means compromising our walk, our our our, our belief, uh, 
you know, compromise the gospel, then we say no to that, right? And Paul says, I would rather please God than to please men. For if I spent my life adjusting myself around to please men, I would no longer be able to please God. So, uh, you know, yeah, let Jesus be your defense in all things. Walk blamelessly before him. Let him be your defense. Uh, and remember I said courage. Uh, or, or don't give in to your fears. Be strong. Only be courageous. We'll look at, a, at Joshua in a moment just very quickly as we catch everything up. But courage is not the absence of fear, but the presence of obedience in the midst of, of the fear. Then our study got a little bit off the freeway and onto the frontage road as we looked uh, took a fresh look on Friday at forgiveness and uh, tried to answer that question and I appreciate uh, the, uh, the the feedback from everybody but uh, remember the three terms that I gave you last week that we stand on soul competency uh, or we talked about forgiveness soul competency which means that every one of us are accountable before God individually all right Solo uh, fide, which means, uh, uh, well, solo fide, which means, uh, you know, faith only. And solo scriptura, which means the scripture only. And Miss Linda, good morning. I have appointments today and tomorrow morning. We'll need to watch later in the day. So sorry to miss out. Well, sweetie, we love you. You have, uh, you be careful and, uh, you know, you just, you just be careful. We love you. Uh, it worked in the nursery yesterday, so some of you didn't get to see her. But what a sweet, incredible, wonderful lady! Had three babies in in uh, in extended session down there. We had our our sweet Tina, and we had uh, we had Sadie, and then a young visitor uh, with a family named uh, Rose. Sweet little girl. All right, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for your love and for your grace and for your mercy. And I pray, Lord, as we look into the Word of God that uh, uh, today that you will open up our eyes and our ears and our heart to understanding your Word, that you might implant it within us deeply, that it becomes of the very part of our life. Help us to, to make room for it in our life, adjusting around it, Lord, that it might it might guide and lead our steps. We just want to be more like you, Lord. As we said yesterday, our, our great concern is to stay there in the center of your will. For it is there that we find blessing uh, forever. So God, I pray that our steps today will find them in the center of the direction, the will that you are leading us. Do you be praised and glory and honor, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, I want to share just two examples uh, of, of what is meant by the definition of, of courage. Remember, I shared with you out of Paul's writing to the church in Corinth. When I came to you, I didn't come with superiority of speech or wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness. I love this. In weakness and fear, with much, uh, with much in fear and with much trembling. Can you, you know, we, we think of Paul as being, you know, this uh, great defender of the faith, which he was. And one of the things that made him a great defender of the faith is even if he was uh, fearful of something, it didn't stop him from moving forward with fear and much trembling. And my message and my preaching was not with persuasive words of wisdom but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your faith doesn't rest in, in, in what I say or, or what I do. It, it rests uh, in, in uh, uh, the power of Almighty God. She was cute. I, uh, had be I was behind them, and she laughed when I smiled at her. She, she was a cutie, real cutie. All right? That give us three real beauty cuties down there. I pray the family will come back. You pray for them 
that uh, God can bring them back and we can get to know them better, all right? And then next, I shared with you Joshua, out of Joshua, and, and uh, I love the book of Joshua. We taught through the book of Joshua uh, some time ago. I think it was the second book we went into, Hebrews and then Joshua. Uh, of the, what, 19 or 20 books we've been in so far, he says, I, uh, just as I've been with Moses, God says to Joshua, I will not fail you or forsake you. Uh, be strong. Be courageous. For you shall uh, give this people possession of the land which I swore to their father to give them. Only be strong and very courageous and be careful to do according to all the law of Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn to the, from the right or the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you might care, be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. I have commanded you, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Four times in that uh, short passage, he is exhorting Joshua, the general, who is now uh, the leader of the nation, as they get ready to go in and capture the land from the Canaanites. Be strong and courageous. That tells me that Joshua probably struggled a little bit like you and I do with uh, uh, being uneasy about certain things or going into certain situations and being... Uh, just a little bit, well, with fear and trembling, with our knees a-knocking. So that's okay. It's okay to be fearful. Just don't give in to it. My favorite quote from all times comes from Teddy Roosevelt. I read his history. Uh, you know, though I don't agree with everything, especially in the latter part of uh, his life and administration, but, uh, but boy, uh, he was right on for most of it. Uh, and again, and it comes from him. He delivered a, uh, a, a speech at the University of Paris in April of 1910. And after he left office, he, 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 he was asked to speak there. And he, he, he gave this long speech called The Citizenship in a Republic. Uh, there's a section in there that is better known uh, at, uh, as the man in the arena. He gave this speech at the Sorbonne in Paris. And Roosevelt described... I need to decline my granddaughter. Uh, Roosevelt described what uh, looks like for a country to have a strong government. Here's the content of his speech. Basically... Roosevelt said that it's not powerful people in your country that makes a nation great. And it's not really wealthy people, and it's not brilliant people that make a country great. Roosevelt made a startling statement in this speech, The Citizenship of the Republic, it says, what makes a nation great is good people whose hearts are right with one another. Then he said, it's not just good people, it's people who have the kind of courage that they can handle whatever life throws at them. When it comes your way, you stand. And in the middle of that speech, Roosevelt describes uh, this analogy. Uh, this part of the speech is referred to as the man in the arena. Maybe one of those that are probably one of the most quoted statements by Teddy Roosevelt. Many of you may have, have heard it already. But here it is. It says, it is not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how a strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows the great enthusiasms, the 
great devotions and spends some time himself in a worthy cause who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the least at least fails while daring greatly so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. You see, it's not the setback and point of finger. The credit goes to those who will get in the game. It's one thing to be a Sunday quarterback. It's another thing to get dusty and dirty in the midst of the play. And Miss Stacy, good morning, Miss Stacy Richie Duffy, sweet, sweet lady. I think of her as one of my one of the girls, but she is a fully grown and beautiful woman. Miss Stacy, it's good to see you here this morning. All right, when you're in the arena, you see. Roosevelt said that if you listen to your critics, it'll destroy you. Stop listening to them because they're not in the arena. They're not doing what you're doing. It's, it's kind of like, you know, I said something to somebody one time and, and they handed a tool to me and said, here, if you think you can do it better. And I thought that was a very good statement. Put me in my place. But I couldn't have done better. I just happened to have a word of encouragement, right? Before I step into that role, I need to really be in the game myself. When you're in the arena following Jesus, doing what he's calling you to do, there's only one voice that matters, and that's his voice. Everyone else's voice you know, carry some weight? Yeah, should I listen to people when they bring a word of, well, even criticism? Yeah, you know, by the way, I'm going to tell you, the Bible never calls you to be a critic. You, do you all know that? Nowhere is the gift of criticism to be found. Now, this may come as a shock to many of us, but it's not. God doesn't give us any instruction to criticize. But it does give us great instruction to exhort and to encourage, to be a paraclete, to come alongside. You see, the difference is, as a critic, I can sit out here and uh, I can be like a diagnostician and say, here's your problem. Right? Right? Get it straightened out. Fix it. You made a mistake. I, I can stand on the outside of the arena and shout what they ought to be doing. But if I'm an exhorter, if I'm an encourager, then I'm going to get right down in the middle of the play with them, and I'm going to get connected to them and join with them, and I'm going to walk with them side by side, allowing them to lean on me you see, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to be a clinician, not a diocese. You know what a clinician is? A clinician is somebody that is actually involved in helping to take care of the problem. Where somebody who just diagnoses the problem can set off not involved. What your critics may say about you is not nearly as important as what Jesus thinks. So let me ask you a question. How do you handle your haters. And I can't help but think we, we, we've all had them or even have them. People who just love to see you fumble and stumble. Ever been there? Maybe we have to ask ourselves, how do we react when somebody stumbles who has been a critical of us? Do we sit back and say, hey, hey, he got his? Or are we sorrowful 
and willing to go to that brother who has stumbled or sister and say, here, lovingly, let me give you a hand up. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yes, our critics can say something to us. Even our, our friends can come to us with exhortation. And we should listen because there's things that they'll see in my life that might need to be adjusted. And, and, and we ought to be able to handle that. But in the end of it all is what Jesus thinks and what he says. The challenge today is to listen to his voice and let his voice drown out all the others around you. And if their voice is speaking with his voice, listen. We move on to assuming the cost. So my, my challenge for each of us is to let go of areas of our life that, don't, that, that, that we don't have any control over. If you're saying that's a lot easier said than done, you know, I get it, you're right. I realize that, so let me see if I can break it down in uh, three smaller pieces, if I can. If you do these three smaller steps, maybe it'll help you do the big thing, which is getting control back to God in the areas of your life that he deserves control over. Areas that we've We've struggled with, and we 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 tried to you know to conquer and been unable to. Anybody got areas of their life that you just battled with and fought with for years and years and years, and you don't seem to be able to get a handle on it? Well, we talk you about assuming the cost. It's hard to let go when we. Uh, when regarding my children and let God work in them. Oh, kiddo, that's, for a parent, that's that's on the top shelf. That's on the top shelf, absolutely right. You see your kids doing something that you know, but you don't have the power to, do, to, 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 and to let God do the work. And can I share something with you that, uh, Alyssa, that, that may not be very encouraging. It doesn't get easier as they get older. You know, and you, you watch your adult children, and uh, you, you really have no real say now in what's going on the older they get. And you have to trust it to God. You have to. Because you don't have any control. Look at Acts 5, starting in the last part of verse 21. Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, even all the senate and the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison, and they returned and reported back, saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely, and the guards standing at the door but when we had opened it, we found no one inside. Now when the captain, the temple guard, and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. That word means that it caused an uproar. Right there in the Senate room, caused a giant uproar uproar. But someone came and reported, <laughs> whoa, settle down, lower the temperature, I know where they are. The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. Now, this is setting a scene, folks, that I want you to understand because you, can you see what's going on in that room? They're all ready to lower the boom on the, the apostles. They go down to bring them out of prison. The prison is empty. Everything is as it should be. Locked up securely, guards in place, but nobody home. The report comes and it breaks into chaos in the room. 
and then somebody comes down and 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 I, I don't know what it would take it to get their attention but you know blow a whistle you know whatever but everybody turns and they look at this one guy he says hey hey yo calm down I know where they are these men that you put in prison they're they're standing in the temple <laughs> like yesterday teaching the people everybody is stunned they what are they gonna say they look at each other and the captain gathers his officers and went with his officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence why for they were afraid of the people that they might get stoned now I want you to see the day before they grab these guys and they drag them off and they throw them into prison come in the next day they're gone now when they go to get them this huge crowd is formed around them and they're talking to everybody about Jesus uh, Peter would you kindly come along with us we'd like to discuss this matter with you in private if you don't mind could you take a few minutes from your you know your sermonizing and and, and come with us you know they went politely to bring them back without violence because they were afraid that if they went and grabbed a hold of them and drug them out of that crowd the crowd would have risen up against them and stoned them now let me give you the first little chip off this block we're going to take three chunks out of it let go of fame let go of your reputation let go of all the people and their opinions about you good bad let go of it because you see we can get in a much problem a much trouble with all the good things that are said because it puffs up and builds up our pride right so let's let's just put that out on a shelf let go of it our text gives us this group of guys who are getting serious about reaching the community of Jesus and their reputations on the line in fact the apostles have a lot more than just their reputation on the line when you and I start to, to, to do this kind of thing when we start to get serious about reaching people for Christ it'll impact our reputation it may even cost us more than our reputation look at the cost to these disciples talk about people uh, to, to talk to people about Jesus it, it, it cost them look at the sacrifice they had to make now when the uh, high priest and his associates came they called the council together even all the Senate and the sons of Israel and sent orders to the prison house that they be brought but the officers came and and did not find them in prison they returned and reported back saying we found uh, the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the door but when we opened up we found Found no one inside and when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this the apostles were teaching they were preaching that Jesus was the only way to heaven religious leaders got so mad that they arrested them threw them in jail God supernaturally rescued these people by sending an angel to deliver them now please don't rush over the last phrase in verse 24 because it's talking about what would come of this if you were a part of the temple police or the chief of the temple police what you're reading right now is a capital offense to say something like this we arrested these guys and put them in jail we expected you uh, by your own life to make sure that these guys stayed in jail and now you're telling me that these guys are no longer there you messed up because you messed up it's going to cost your head me stone put to death for the fact that these guys are no longer in jail i love that god has this really really great sense of humor Look at the what the Bible is telling us. Not only did these guys 
not in jail. Not only did the angel rescue the guys, not only did he unlock the prison doors, but apparently he locked the door behind them, veiled the eyes of the guards that were standing at the door so they didn't even notice all of this was going on, and let the apostles go. If you're the chief of the temple police, you're freaking out about now because you're thinking you're closer to losing your life for the fact that these guys are no longer in prison than you, you, you could ever imagine. And if you're the high priest of the Sanhedrin, you're, standing, uh, you're starting to feel pretty silly right now because you just condemned a group of people, sentenced them to jail, and they're not there. Now you're starting to look just a little bit silly in front of this crowd. In other words, your reputation is now starting to be impacted by the whole thing. And you call, you've call you already called an emergency session of the Sanhedrin. On top of that, you got the whole Senate of the sons of Israel together in, in, in all the other movers and shakers and all the people that make the decisions and all the power structure are called together. Man, you've got it all on the line. Think about an emergency session of the Congress, both House and Senate, and you invite all nine members of the Supreme Court and the President and the Vice President. They're all called together in one room, and the agenda is this. What are we going to do about these guys who are preaching a message that's undermining our authority? Now listen for a second. One person didn't even get invited to this party, did they? One person wasn't on the invite list. Who's the one person that wasn't on the invite list? Anybody? Who didn't get invited to this meeting of the religious elite? Of the political movers and shakers? Anybody? If you say God you'd probably be right. If you said the Holy Spirit, you'd absolutely be right. See, what you cannot miss from this, uh, from the Bible is the only voice that matters is the voice of God. They weren't looking to him, were they? They were looking to their own narrow, pigeon-headed view of the world. They weren't looking at Scripture. They wasn't calling on them, what does, what does the Word of God say about what these men are doing? Miracle after miracle, you know, happening after happening, and yet we're not getting it? Maybe it's time that we said, hey, let's slow down. Maybe we need to pray. Maybe we need to ask God into this situation. But, of course, these people didn't believe. Half of them didn't believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in the resurrection, miracles, angels, none of that. The other half did. These weren't people that, that got along with each other. They were like this. The only reason they're getting along now is they have a common enemy. What you cannot miss here is the only voice that matters was the only voice that was not invited into that meeting. It doesn't matter what Caiaphas or Annas or any of the other religious leaders think. It doesn't matter what everybody else is saying. It's the only voice that matters is what is God saying. These religious leaders are trying to figure out how to control the masses. And in the process, they end up on the wrong side of what the Holy Spirit is doing and how the Holy Spirit is speaking to his people. Do you see that? The only thing that matters in your life today or tomorrow or next week is listening to the still small voice of God. Listening to the whisper of the Holy Spirit, even if it's going to cost you your reputation. It takes great courage to do 
what you see the disciples doing. In fact, they were listening to God. The angel said, here's the instruction I got. Go back into the temple and start telling them about the life that you have in Christ. And they did it. This group over here, they're interested in power, fame, control, position, right? One group listening to God, one group not. What if they had to all just listen to God? Can you imagine what could have happened? There's only one voice that matters. Can we get that firmly planted in? Listen, you know, in 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 intently to do what he's he he he, he say. Let the chips fall where they may. Let the fame go to King Jesus, and don't worry about what other people have to say. Let go of the fame. Let go of any games. Oh, we're great game players. Let go of control. The game of religion. Let me explain to you it this way. Religion <laughs> becomes a game that's rigged to cause us to fail. Ultimately, all religions fall into one category of setting rules to try and make you be a good boy or a good girl. Do this, you're good. Do that, you're bad. Don't do this. Uh, and if you don't do this, you're going to be a good person. Ultimately, religious leaders try to control people by setting rules. The problem is that Jesus came to do away with that, to fulfill it all. And if we understand anything from the New Testament, we know that Jesus came to eliminate the desire or even the hope of following the law. He proved to us that we couldn't do it, right? Remember a, a Romans 8, verses 1 through 4, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Some of us are still trying to get that through our thick skulls, right? Because the voice of the Sanhedrin the voice of the council is so loud they keep us in our prison cell. And the angel comes and opens the door and says, hey, come on out. And we say, ah, can't you hear what they're saying? He say, stop listening to them. Don't play their game. Come out. Get back to doing the work. God gave you to. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it is through the flesh, God did. He's already done it. Sending his own son in the likeness of sin in the flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. How? Because of what he did. He came to give you one rule. Love God with all every fiber of your being. On the other side of that, love your neighbor as yourself. Rule one, do that thing. And you just accomplish all that you've been asked to do. All of the law of the prophets are summed up in that one, right? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now listen, if you're loving God that way, the natural outflow is to love your neighbor as yourself. Am I correct? So I think I really want to say uh, to you this way. Before we even look at verse 25, has to say, listen to me, and please don't forget this. Oh, I didn't put that up there. Religion comes to set rules, but Jesus came to set me free. Are you religious? Or are you a Christ follower? 
I met very religious people all over the world. Hindu man that had dedicated this arm to his God, bound it to his, and for 40 years had never used that arm. It was nothing but bone and flesh. His fingernails had grown through the hand. Can you imagine that? Now that's religious people. That's religious dedication. That's religion at its supreme. All to please a God by doing this. But Jesus came to set me free. He came to accomplish all those rules for me and to set me free from having to follow them myself. All I got to do is love him. I don't have to worry about the rules then, right? Well, my time has well spent, so I'm going to stop right here. We'll pick up on this piece and move it forward. One voice. What is that voice you're listening to today? And who are you going to listen to today? Father, I want to thank you so much for the wonder the power of your word and what we can learn from it. Let us not be like this crowd of Sanhedrin. Let us invite you in so that we can hear the only one voice that needs to be heard. And let us be like the disciples, Lord, who, who just simply obeyed that one voice like Elijah there in, in, in a cave there on the side of the mountain listening for God and you sent a great wind but you weren't in the wind you sent an earthquake but you weren't in the earthquake you sent a roaring fire but you weren't in the roaring fire Lord you were in the still small voice Lord if we would get quiet before you for just a moment and shut out the world that we might hear that still quiet peaceful voice and then obey that voice God I love you thank you for our sweet family out here bless them Lord with your word and Lord give them courage to walk in it. In Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the power of your authority. We pray in agreement with you. Amen. And amen. God bless you. See you in the morning at nine. We're going to pick up here and keep moving right on straight forward. God bless.